Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Unique Heart Attack Symptoms in Women. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Margaret Cecil. Margaret is the Director for Advanced Practice and Cardiovascular Service Line at CHI St. Luke's Health and is a certified adult nurse practitioner. I have a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. A recording of the webinar will be available on imaginebetterhealth.org. We'd like to hear from you during the presentation today, so feel free to ask questions in the chat box or on Twitter using hashtag CHIHeartChat. And we'll spend a couple of minutes answering your questions at the end of the webinar. We'll also be tweeting links to articles from at CHI underscore St. Luke's throughout the presentation where you can find more information on topics discussed today. Last, we'd like you to feel free to share any of the information you learned today on your social networks using hashtag CHI heart chat and get your friends and family involved to help them learn the importance of heart health. For those of you just joining, welcome to today's session, Unique Heart Attack Symptoms in Women, presented by Margaret Cecil. Let's get started. So just a little bit of background on heart disease and how it impacts America and in women. So heart disease is the number one cause of death for women in America. And that 44 million people in the United States are affected by heart disease. That's about the same as the entire population of Texas and New York combined. So truly, this is, um, this is an epidemic in our country and worldwide. It's something that we really need to know about and need to be educated about. And that 90% of women have at least one risk factor for heart disease or stroke. So that's a lot of us. That's a lot of our family members. That's a lot of the people that we know. And that 80% of heart attacks and strokes can be prevented by lifestyle changes and education. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, what those lifestyle changes can be and just being educated about if you did have a heart attack, what to do and um, really how to take care of yourself or how to take care of your loved one should this happen to one of them. So what are we talking about today? So I'm going to give you one kind of a clinical slide. Again, like Angie said, I'm a, I'm a nurse practitioner, so I'll have a tendency to, to get too clinical on you. Um, but, but truly, this is an important slide to take a look at exactly what we're talking about. So heart disease, um, when we talk about a heart attack or heart disease, we're looking at the tiny little blood vessels that supply the heart with blood. And so you can see those here, um, that there, there are just about two or three main coronary arteries. And when you look over to the right-hand side of this slide, you can see what's called a cholesterol plaque buildup. And what happens when you have a heart attack is that plaque gets so large and it ruptures and it actually will cause a complete blockage of that coronary artery which supplies your heart with blood. And if your heart can't get blood and oxygen then that heart muscle dies and that decreases your heart's ability to pump blood out to the rest of your body. So that's really what we're talking about today um, and how to prevent this very, very um, significant and life-threatening disease state. And so we're going to go into talking a little bit about the unique heart attack risk factors for women. So first of all, and I like to talk about the modifiable or controllable risk factors first. So these are the things that right now today you can make a change. You can make a change to um, make these uh, risk factors decrease for you of, of these first ones that I'm going to talk about. So tobacco use. So not only you smoking, but being around anybody that smokes. So firsthand or secondhand smoke causes significant constriction um, or narrowing of those coronaries. And it's not just those arteries in your heart. That's arteries everywhere. So you really want to make sure that um, if you smoke, that you need to make a plan to stop. And usually that's looking at family support, support from children, support from friends, because uh, usually you need help to do that. But that's a really, really important piece. The next thing is your diet. So looking at what you're eating and what you're putting in your body is a really important part of um, the contributing factors to a heart attack and coronary artery disease. So 
looking at the inflammation and the cholesterol buildup, those little pieces of cholesterol that are floating around in, in your bloodstream um, can attach and adhere to, to the inner lining of the, of the wall of those coronary arteries. So it's important for you to make healthy choices from, a, from an eating standpoint. We're actually going to do another webinar um, here in a couple of weeks that really dives deeply into how you can be eating healthier and making sure that you're eating to decrease the risk of heart disease. The next thing that I want to talk to you about kind of goes together, so physical inactivity and obesity. So we know that physical inactivity and obesity really can contribute to the risk factors for having a heart attack. So um, patients who we see that have um, increased physical activity also have a decreased blood pressure and just overall a healthier um, outlook and a prognosis from a lifestyle perspective. <clears throat> Um, physical inactivity, again, can lead to increased cholesterol. So when you see um, a couple of more dot points down, you see that high cholesterol is a significant contributing factor. So there are good types of cholesterol and there are bad types of cholesterol. And it's important for you to understand the difference between those. You'll hear your doctor talk about LDLs and HDLs and triglycerides. Um, and it's important to have the conversation around which cholesterols are good cholesterols and which cholesterols are bad cholesterols and getting your numbers where they need to be, whether that's between um, the use of changing your diet or utilizing medications to get your, get your cholesterol numbers where they need to be. Next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, high blood pressure. So when your blood pressure is high, those are those numbers where you get, you know, 120 over 80 or 140 over 90. Your blood pressure is a significant contributing factor to heart disease because it's the amount of pressure that is consistently placed on those tiny little coronary arteries that supply your heart with blood. And so when you have a high blood pressure, that's a significant source of stress on those coronary arteries on a regular basis. So again, modifiable factors, increasing your physical activity, even just 30 minutes of walking a few times a week can have, a, can have an impact on that. Additionally, looking at um, making sure that you take the medications that you might need to decrease blood pressure is important as well. Um, to get those pieces where they need to be to decrease your overall risk. <clears throat> Additionally, diabetes, which goes along with um, obesity and physical activity, um, is something that can really um, impact your risk factors for heart attack. Because of the increased uh, sugar, so we all know that diabetes, you hear people talk about their blood sugars, right? And so it's important for you to know that that increased level of sugar that's circulating in those coronary arteries can again lead to those little plaque ruptures and then more, more of a chance of heart attack. So having all of those different pieces in control um, are things that you can take a hold of and those are things that you really can have an impact on today. Um, but you have to make a plan, so we'll talk about that here in a little while. The other pieces that I want to talk about are still important and they might not be modifiable or controllable, but it's important for you as a woman to know, um, or, or maybe if you're a man and you're watching, um, to know your risk factors or your, um, your significant other or your sister or your, um, your daughter. Um, it's important for you to know about their risk factors so that they can be in control. So genetics. So we don't have any control over our genetics, but it's important to know them. So according to the CDC, Asian Indians have the highest reported premature coronary artery disease and significant mortality associated with that. So that's people having heart attacks at a younger age and people having heart attacks that, that, that can kill them. And so knowing the risk factors can help you um, to take action were you to have any of the symptoms that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, also, there's an increase, obviously, of coronary artery disease and heart attacks in African Americans um, and Mexican Americans as well. And so knowing that on the front end is, is a very important part. Looking through the rest of these, uh, menopause can cause changes in hormones that can lead to an increased heart attack risk. Your family history. So as a female, if you have a family member that has had some type of cardiac event before the age of 65, that's a risk factor that you need to know about and make sure that you're monitoring. Um, and then additionally, uh, sex, and we've already talked a little bit about race and ethnicity. So going on to recognizing the symptoms. 
So these are the important parts that, um, you know, we see this woman here in this picture, and it's not the typical picture that we think about when we think about a heart attack, right? So we think about um, a man that is clutching his chest, and he feels like, you know, he's got an elephant sitting on his chest, and that's kind of the classic heart attack picture that we think of. That's not always the case for women. It can be. It can absolutely be the way that a heart attack presents. But it's important for you to know that there are a lot of other pieces that you should recognize um, for heart attack symptoms in women. So the first one, uncomfortable pressure. This can sometimes just be a squeezing in your chest. It could be in the center of your chest. It could be the left side of your chest. Really, it could be anywhere, but it's not always that elephant sitting on your chest type feeling. The second one, stomach pain or nausea. So a lot of times women will mistake this for a stomach ulcer. They'll mistake this for getting the flu, um, heartburn, abdominal pressure. We, we sometimes have women that will report that they feel like they have an elephant sitting on their stomach. And so they're not associating that with um, their heart. But the way our nerves are distributed is, is different. And so this is just the reality of knowing what the symptoms might or might not be. Back, neck, or jaw pain is actually more common in women than it is in men when we think about presentation of a heart attack. So um, pain that radiates up into your neck, especially on the left side of your neck, um, down your arm, obviously, is, is very important to recognize. And you don't always think about your heart when you think about those. You might think about a toothache. You might think about you know TMJ, things like that. Um, but it is something that with the risk factors that we talked about previously, that you should, you should be making that association. Shortness of breath. So becoming short of breath or becoming lightheaded, that's not proportionate with the amount of exertion that you've, you've just done. And so thinking about, you know, if you go up one flight of stairs and you're significantly short of breath, or you just, you know, walk across the parking lot, and that, that's not normal for you. That is, that is really outside of what um, your normal exertion um, is to become short, short of breath or lightheaded. Uh, that's something that you need to get checked out and you need to talk to your doctor about. Additionally, cold sweats. So this is more common in women, and it's sweating that is kind of associated with a uh, stress-type sweat, um, but not really, not appropriately so. So looking at cold sweats and then also extreme fatigue. So I give the example that uh, one patient gave to me was that she would vacuum a little bit, and then she would feel like she needed to sit down and take a nap. That's not the appropriate amount of fatigue for, for what she had just done. And so those are the things that you need to think about. If you're, if you're that tired and that fatigued, um, don't just pass it off as your thyroid. Don't just pass it off as you need to get a little bit more sleep. Those things might be true as well. But uh, you need to make sure that we've ruled out the really important things that, that this could be. So why women don't seek treatment? And you're all guilty. You know you are. I'm guilty as well. So these, these are some of the things that women, we, we think about it, we internalize them, we, we rationalize them. But first of all, we don't recognize the warning signs. So looking at the symptoms that we just talked about and the fact that it's not always a classic presentation of a heart attack. Um, so first of all, we're not always educated about what we think we could see with a heart attack. And that we mistake the symptoms for something much less serious. So we blow it off um, as a stomach ulcer or a little bit of heartburn because of whatever we might have eaten last night. Or might be your thyroid acting up or something like that. But we're going we're gonna to say, I can get to that later. I can think about that later because I've got a lot of other things to do. Um, we're all busy. And um, a lot of times they, people, uh, and women especially, men too, not saying men don't, but they put their family's needs above their own. And so being a mom and uh, maybe working or maybe taking care of an older parent, uh, we all have a million different things going on in our lives. But it is so, so important for you to recognize your risk factors and the symptoms to really be able uh, to still take care of those people into the future. Uh, because the significant mortality and morbidity associated with heart disease um, in America, and especially in women, is significant. And so knowing that you need to um, seek treatment is, is a very, very important part of this. So when to seek help. 
So I want to give you, I've, I've told you to seek help, I've told you to, to go and, you know, go and ask for help, but what, what kind of help and what kind of help do you ask for and what do you really need to do if some of these things are happening to you? So first I want you to think a little bit about whether or not you have a high risk for heart disease. So thinking about um, those risk factors that we talked about. And then if you experience chest pain, the extreme fatigue that we talked about, shortness of breath, if you're experiencing palpitations. So I do want to stop here and talk about palpitations for just a second because palpitations can be common, um, very common in, in everybody. And probably for those of you sitting here watching this webinar, we've all had a few palpitations. I'm sure I've had a few just while I've been giving this talk. It is, um, it is very, very normal to have palpitations, which are just basically um, kind of like a, a skipped extra beat. Your, uh, your heart fills with blood, and it gives a big, strong push. And so sometimes we feel that, and sometimes we don't. A lot of times people will really notice them when they lay down at night, and you're kind of still, and you're kind of quiet. Palpitations can be normal. But it's something that, when associated with any of these other high-risk um, high risk, risk factors, or other symptoms, you want to make sure that you get that checked out and you want to make sure that you make an appointment with your physician um, for those pieces. Again, the light net, lightheadedness, swelling in your lower extremities, those are all things that you want to make sure that um, if it is just something simple, then great. But if it's not, then getting it checked out earlier rather than later is very, very important. Sometimes it's an emergency and many times, um, it, always, a heart attack is a true emergency. So this is the situation where you are having that chest pain or you are having that significant drop pain or significant fatigue that is so overwhelming or shortness of breath. This is what you need to do. You need to call 911 and you need to follow the, the 911 operator's instructions. They might ask you to take an aspirin. So it's a really good idea to have a 325 milligram over-the-counter aspirin. Just have it tucked away at your house because they may ask you to take that and that could be a part of saving some significant heart, heart muscle if you're having a heart attack. Um, you're going to get to a hospital or emergency center immediately. You are not going to drive yourself. And so let me say that again. You are not going to drive yourself to the hospital if you think you're having a heart attack. That is not, um, that is not ever the way um, that you want to address that situation. And I will, um, I will just share very real experience with you of people who have driven family members that they thought were having a heart attack that did indeed have a heart attack in the car and lose consciousness in the car. And um, it was a, a very, very um, difficult outcome. So I want you to be safe. I want you to be um, aware. And I don't want you to drive yourself or have somebody drive you to the hospital. We have great trained EMS and paramedics that, that, that are very, very well trained to help you with that. Um, so staying calm, taking deep, slow breaths, again, this will help to decrease your blood pressure. So if you do think you're having a heart attack, these are ways that you can help to increase the blood flow to your heart if you do indeed have one of those blockages. Um, to, to stay calm, to take deep, slow breaths, to get, through, um, to get through these moments, to get the assessment that you need. So again, reducing the risk. So this is a great little acronym to look at um, to remember how to reduce your risk. So it doesn't give all of the all of the big long list that I gave earlier, but think about your heart. So you're going to halt smoking and other harmful habits. I know I've harped a little bit on smoking today, but really stopping smoking is one of the biggest things that you can do um, to make your heart healthier, and not just your heart, but your your stroke um, your stroke risk and anything else. There are so many different negative consequences associated with smoking. Um, eating healthy, again, we'll talk about that in a whole separate webinar because it's a lot of, a lot of different pieces to talk about. Aerobic exercise, so I know um, a lot of times nurses especially were guilty of, um, well, we walk around a lot, but it's not always aerobic exercise, right? So really getting your heart rate up and keeping that up for a little while is very, very healthy for you. Reduce stress, so reducing the amount of stress you have in your life because stress causes um, Stress causes a significant amount of inflammation in your coronary arteries. And then take control, take action. So the different steps that we talked about earlier of what you need to do if you think you're at risk or having a heart attack, you need to take control and take action because your health is in your hands. 
So here's just a, little, a quick slide about our Heart Healthy Foods Facts and Myths webinar that's going to be coming up. Um, if you're on this webinar, we'll, we'll send out an email so that you know when that's coming up. Um, it's just going to be a really in-depth talk about food and nutrition and all of the different pieces to get you started on eating um, in a heart healthy way. Thank you, Margaret. I think that we all have a really much better idea of the risk factors for heart disease and the symptoms. Um, we do have just a couple of questions that were sent to us, and so I wanted to see if you could answer those for us. Um, the first question we have says that um, Stephanie says that she's worrying about her parents at risk for heart attack but doesn't know how to talk about them. Do you have any recommendations on how to talk to them about heart disease? That's a, that's a really, really good question, Stephanie, and thank you for asking that. Um, that, is, that is such a hard, um, a hard conversation to have with parents. Um, obviously, going through some of the different pieces that we've talked about today, so understanding your risk factors, understanding what behavior modifications need to happen um, is a good way to start that conversation. But what I would say is that when I talk with patients, um, making it real and making it something that is, is tangible is a much, a much better way um, to talk about this with family members. So um, when I talk about this with patients, I try to get at what their, what their loves are. So is their love skiing? Is their love jogging? Is their love their grandkids? What big events do they have coming up? So do they have um, high school graduations of grandchildren? Do they have weddings coming up? These are things that um, if they pass away of a heart attack that they're going to miss. And um, I know that that sounds a little bit uh, uh, difficult to, to handle sometimes, but that's the reality of what we're talking about here. And it is, it is significant. And so I think that um, when you have that conversation, those are the things that you need to think about and talk about that get people to actually change and, and make those heart healthy choices. Thank you for asking that question, Stephanie. The next question we have is from Eileen, and she wonders, at what age should women start focusing on their heart health and looking out for these symptoms? Very, very good question, question Eileen. Thank you. Thank you for that. So um, really, and, and it's I, I realize it's kind of a, a, a past answer, but really at any time. Um, your, your nutrition and your health really starts um, well into your, your, your 20s, your 30s, um, and, and well after that. So making these heart healthy choices are the ways that you start your, um, your method of keeping yourself heart healthy, whether you're 20 years old or 30 years old or 40 years old, 50, 60, 70. These are changes that truly um, you can have an impact on the rest of your life. So it's never too early to start, um, and I would really encourage um, the different heart-healthy habits that we've talked about uh, for anybody, for any age. And just one more question. Um, Megan wonders, are there any increased risks of heart attack during or after pregnancy? Very, very good question, Megan. So pregnancy is a very, um, is a very high, what we call a high volume state. So um, you, many people know that during pregnancy you have an, a significantly increased amount of blood volume. So if you do have risk factors or other um, modifiable or non-modifiable risk factors, um, you can be at increased risk for a heart attack during pregnancy. And so because of that high volume state, it puts, like we talked about the high blood pressure, so it puts more pressure on your, um, on your arteries and that's everywhere in your body. So it, that can actually be um, a, an increased risk if you have the other associated risk factors. Now again, in general, women of childbearing age are not usually quite as at risk as women um, that, are, that are after childbearing age, but it is still something that if you have, you know, five, six, seven of those risk factors already as a younger person, it's something that you would definitely want to think about during pregnancy. Well, thank you again, Margaret, for um, joining us today and answering our questions about the unique heart attack symptoms in women and the risk that heart disease poses to women especially. And um, for those of you who joined us, thank you so much for joining us. Um, our next webinar can be found 
um, on Twitter. And also, if we didn't get to your question today, you can always use hashtag CHI heart chat and ask us online and we will be happy to um, respond and find out those answers for you, no matter if they're a week from now or two weeks from now. So thank you again for joining us and have a good day. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Unique Heart Attack Symptoms in Women. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Margaret Cecil. Margaret is the Director for Advanced Practice and Cardiovascular Service Line at CHI St. Luke's Health and is a certified adult nurse practitioner. I have a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. A recording of the webinar will be available on imaginebetterhealth.org tomorrow. And we'd love to hear from you during the presentation today. So feel free to ask questions in the chat box or on Twitter using hashtag CHI heart chat. And we will spend a couple of minutes answering your questions at the end of the webinar. We'll also be tweeting links to articles from at CHI underscore St. Luke's throughout the presentation where you can find more information on the topics discussed today. And lastly, We'd like you to feel free to share any of the information you learned today on your social networks using hashtag CHI Heart Chat and get your family and friends involved to help them learn the importance of heart health. For those of you just joining us, welcome to today's session, Unique Heart Attack Symptoms in Women, presented by Margaret Cecil. Let's get started with a couple of quick polls and heart health questions to see where our audience stands on topics discussed today. Take it away, Margaret. 